Sorry for this delay. Uh, Thomas uh, from Bloomberg is going to take over this uh, panel. I'm going to leave you the floor now. Thomas, you have uh, 55 minutes to finish your panel session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and hi, everybody. Um, so yes, my name's Tom Seal. I've been reporting on technology, media and telecoms for the last few years at Bloomberg in London. Uh, and increasingly, that has meant space and especially low Earth orbit. So I'm delighted to have a panel of experts with me to talk about the emerging business of small satellites. So we have Connor Jonas, who's a program manager from launch services company Exo Launch, Anna Annesland, the president of small sat propulsion company ThrustMe, Caleb Henry, senior analyst from Quilty Analytics, and Vitenis Debuzas, the CEO of small sat bus manufacturer Nano Avionics. I'm going to let them say a few words about what they do, um, and then we can get chatting. So, um, Anna, would you like to go first? Yes, with pleasure. Uh, so let me, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, first, thank you very much uh, for Tony and the uh, Access Space Alliance to, to invite me to this interesting conference. I've been listening uh, as in particular for the previous session, I found it extremely interesting. So just a few words of what we do and, and uh, why we are in this panel. So uh, trust me, we were created in 2017. We are a spin out after decades of research uh, in space propulsion. We are experts in propulsion and also uh, strategies of satellite deployments in space. And we uh, have now a complete in-orbit mobility uh, portfolio for our clients. Um, we know that uh, since it was a space economy uh, session, I was thinking we should actually put up some numbers. Uh, the numbers that are important to me is the number of satellites that will be launched. It's an exponential growth in the number of satellites. So uh, we predict uh, over 12,000 satellites to be launched. Uh, all of them or most of them in constellations. And this makes uh, some issues and some things that we need to think about. And I would like to start out with a citation from uh, Gwen Shotwell. When you're flying a brick, it's troublesome. And it, it makes me think about when I was uh, uh, young in the 80s, uh, it was still time for hitchhiking and you moved around with hitchhiking. I don't think it's done that much anymore. Uh, but what happens is that you get to places where you don't necessarily want to be. And I think that the new space era is actually in the 80s when we did hitchhiking, either because we didn't have a license or because we didn't afford uh, our own means of mobility. So now this has to change. Uh, the small satellites uh, that have used uh, uh, no propulsion in, in the past, I think it's the time now for them to increase their business models uh, and improve their economy of scale uh, with propulsion and then with the bigger satellites uh, to improve the means of in our mobility to make it more economical. So this is what Trust Me is here to do, uh, to enable in space mobility for every single satellite in orbit. Uh, and to make sure that they have the uh, means to be economical in orbit, but also safe in orbit. Uh, we do that by really looking at, uh, the first thing we do is to look at the propulsion aspects of the satellites. Uh, propulsion is a very technical uh, thing for satellites, and it was very complex in the past. Uh, a lot of vendors had to be involved to be able to do propulsion uh, on a satellite. So our aim is to, and we have done it, is to make uh, complete turnkey solutions of propulsion. We use high performing technologies that have already been proven in space. We know this technology since the 60s. And then we look at what do we have to replace uh, to uh, make them uh, useful for the new space paradigm of constellations. So we replace the pressurized systems with solid propellant and then we build in digital intelligence in the systems 
and of today, I think it's the most uh, performance systems that you have uh, on the market. We have three missions already in space. We have delivered to several clients. And now we have badge orders uh, that we are delivering in, in 2021 and, and so on. So to, this is my last slide. I will not speak uh, much more. I think I've taken up my five minutes. Uh, I've, so you sent us, Thomas, uh, four questions. I have highlighted in bold uh, two of them that I feel comfortable uh, addressing. Uh, exciting new technologies, um, initiatives and trends in the industry. There is a lot of things happening. Uh, we are very excited about the missions uh, our clients are, are having from SAR constellations. We are seeing also uh, new imaging uh, type of satellites uh, where you can really understand what is happening in real time on Earth. I find that very exciting for many reasons. And then uh, what is also our mantra is to have a sustainable use of space while we are generating value on Earth and also beyond. And therefore, uh, I put up one of the satellites that we are on board for 2022, which is really uh, dedicated to space debris or space situational awareness, um, where we want to do real collision avoidance maneuvers with low thrust operations and monitor the satellite operations in, in real time. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and we can come back to some of those points on the bigger questions uh, in the discussion. Uh, I'm just going to go in the order on my screen. So uh, next up, uh, Caleb, would you be up for saying a few words about um, what you want to keep you busy? Sure. I, I had a hunch that I was next if this was going to go on alphabetical order. Uh, uh, pitch to say, uh, happy to be part of the panel. I'm a senior analyst for Cruelty Analytics. We do uh, we provide research and advisory services for the satellite and space industry. Uh, focus a lot on the financial side of things. Before that, I was a journalist for seven years, covering uh, mainly satellite communications, but also remote sensing and the ecosystem around that. So manufacturing, launch, ground and regulation and everything else. So I continue in my uh, role for the past, I guess, six or seven months now uh, as an analyst, helping to write reports about the industry and various trends and um, keeping up to speed on, on things, especially small sets, which is relevant for today's topic. Great, nice and concise. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, and then over to Connor then. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, let me see here, get the screen share going. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, thank you. All right, <clears throat> excellent. So I'll try and keep this, um, oh no, I'm having a, I'm getting a flashing issue, is it? Oh, I got flashing again. You guys see this issue? Yeah, I can now uh, see the, the slides. Oh, they disappeared. Yeah, if you can go ahead and do the screen share, that would be great. Um, I don't I, know if it's a graphics issue or. I'm afraid I'm unable to download your your um, slides, Connor. So are you able to speak uh, on them and, uh, and we can imagine them? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, let me just pull them up here. So I can just talk about ExoLaunch exactly. So ExoLaunch, um, what are we exactly? We, we are a company that offers multiple services and products, but primarily around delivering access to space for small satellites. Um, we do this by integrating um, and compiling clusters of satellites for launch on large vehicles and by uh, manufacturing separation systems um, and building these clusters together and delivering them as packages to uh, various launch vehicles um, around the world. Uh, and we also recently announced our next product, which is the Reliance Space Tug, um, which not only will be used to provide more um, diverse orbits to our small sat customers, but will also help with this uh, debris removal problem that um, is becoming more and more important uh, every day. So um, this is something we have some nice pictures of on the uh, presentation, but you'll have to use your imagination. Um, give you, I'll give you a brief history here of the company here. We started actually um, in 2013 was our first um, launch service uh, launch where we provided the ride share of uh, CubeSats on Soyuz for our first ride share mission. Um, and since then, we've been providing uh, many, we've done many, many launches on Soyuz, on Falcon, on Electron, um, and others um, throughout the years. 
in 2015 was the, the launch of our first product, our ExoPod CubeSat deployer. Um, and so this, since then we've developed the CubeSat deployer in multiple sizes and configurations. Uh, and then in 2019, our Carbonix uh, microsatellite separation system re received flight heritage. And since then we've deployed uh, 10 satellites, uh, microsats in space, uh, customer satellites. And we're poised to deploy another 10 here um, after the Transporter 2 mission uh, in about a month. Um, and then uh, this year we announced our next product, which is the, uh, the Reliant Space Tug, um, which will be um, a useful space tug vehicle for being able to expand the capabilities of, of rideshare programs, um, but as well as increased performance for, for small launchers. And um, one of our commitments with this space tug program is that um, we will be uh, collecting space debris on each mission and deorbiting it uh, quickly with, with the space tug uh, after our satellites, our customer satellites have been separated. So um, this is something we're really excited about as our as our next big step forward. Um, that's, uh, that's more or less um, the company. Um, and uh, I myself am a program manager at Exo Launch and uh, primarily responsible for the, uh, the Carbonic system uh, development uh, and test. And uh, I'll be taking um, a big position with the Reliant program as it clears up as well. It's fantastic. Thanks, Connor. And uh, really sorry we couldn't see, see those slides. Um, I'm sure they were great. But, um, so now over to Vitenis um, for his intro, and then we can uh, start sort of throwing some ideas around. Hello, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Thomas. Uh, my name is Vitenis. I'm a co-founder of Nano Avionics. Um, our company is focused on delivering uh, small sat and, well, microsat and nanosat uh, satellite technology. We've been incorporated back in 2014 in Lithuania. Uh, today we have more than 100 employees, uh, around four offices. I mean, two of them is in Lithuania. Then we have uh, an office in the United States and uh, United Kingdom. So, yeah, as I mentioned, our main focus is uh, small satellite technology and in particular systems related to constellations, uh, the efficient management of constellations and, of course, the hardware itself, I mean the buses. So uh, today we have products ranging from uh, well-known, let's say, CubeSat form factor, which is uh, 6, 12, and 16U. And uh, we recently introduced a um, new bus, which is capable of accommodating uh, the payload of around 50 to 60 kg. And total, total flight mass is around 100 to 150 kg. Um, our customers are ranging from... IoT to Earth observation. So yeah, we are happy about our our experience we have so far. Um, also, you know, uh, to mention uh, fundamental research programs. And um, yeah, I hope we will have. I believe we will have interesting discussion during our panel uh, because constellation technologies and you know related problems and 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 the growth problems in the future is the thing which concerns us the most the most and we see very nice trends in the market um and uh, yeah I'm, I'm i'm ready to share some ideas and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, um looking forward to, to, to the discussion fantastic thanks for tennis um well we've already touched on it so i think a good first question uh, is a big picture one, which is how would you describe the status today of the small sat sector or business? Um, I suppose particularly in Europe, um, it's becoming a flurry of announcements, despite the fact um, most of you have been in this for, for several years. So what's changed? Is it still speculative or is this, you know, the moment the, the sector kind of grows up, maybe starts even becoming profitable? Um, please feel free to jump in with any thoughts. Maybe for tennis, you'd like to go first. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Um, I remember I started to look to look into this business around 2008, 2009, and I should say there was uh, the peak of of one cycle. We remember quite a lot of invest investments back then. I mean, huge companies and huge investments. I mean, multi-million investments, right? 
Um, so 10 years have passed. And what they see right now, it's kind of the second cycle or, 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 or the second wave, of course, of the, this kind of things. And uh, I should say that today, let's say the environment is bringing much more tangible results than comparing, you know, 10 years ago. Of course, I'm very happy about the uh, general situation in the world and in, in, in Europe that a lot of investors are coming and really huge money is coming and flowing into this market, especially now through this SPAC process, which is, you know, kind of big, big thing. But in general, I'm very happy that we started to grow the company, to grow the business, you know, back in the days, like 10 years ago. By then it was a bit too early, but now it's right on time because a lot of companies, I mean, IoT, M2M in general, F observation, et cetera, are coming on the floor with tangible business ideas. So this starts to seem like a real real market, I mean, a real industry. So this is my, you know, generalistic, let's say, conclusion. That's, that's great. Um, does anyone, anyone disagree with the, ten, the tennis? I imagine not, but... Uh, you know. <laughs> no, I would like to definitely agree with them. Um, I would say from the perspective of, of the launch market, um, it's, it's really booming right now. We had, um, with the Transporter One mission uh, in January, we had um, a personal record of 30 satellites and about 500 kilograms of satellite mass um, that we hosted on that mission. The total mission was something like 120, 130, maybe even 140 satellites. Um, and that was the record-breaking mission at the time. And now already six months later, um, we're, we're putting up a ton of, of mass. So double the mass of satellites that we're um, bringing on the rideshare mission. And, and that's only six months later. So um, it really feels like that uh, the satellite market is really exploding right now. Um, and we're hearing from a lot of our customers too that they're um, – you know, their projections are, are outpacing um, or their, their actual revenues are outpacing projections right now and, um, and that they're able to increase manufacturing more than they had expected to. Um, so it really feels like um, things are, are really happening in the market right now. Um, yeah, maybe I can say something else. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, what Vitani said was uh, very pertinent, very uh, correct. What what has been happening in the uh, 10 years ago and up to now is tech demonstrations and really to understand how we can uh, improve uh, the ability to use data from space. And it's very similar to what you, you saw in the, in the phone industry and the iPad industry before. Uh, in the beginning, I mean, I remember I had my iPod. Uh, I could put a little bit of photos on it, but it was not really useful. And now we use it all the time. And, uh, and if we compare it with the same situation, it's, it's uh, exactly the same. Now we have the infrastructure, the technology start to be mature, and now it is time to, to actually get revenues and useful uh, information from data and from space. And Caleb, you look at the financial uh, side of this and uh, you've covered it closely. So, you know, what's, what's changed? Why? Uh, this kind of new wave of investment? Is it a different kind of investor as well? Um, what's changed? Well, excuse me, I think that uh, a lot of it just has to do with the maturity from a technology perspective of uh, small sat hardware. I think CubeSats definitely helped uh, and then more standardized buses helped. And the fact that as more companies got into this, um, there is an ecosystem that made it so that operators don't have to do everything themselves. You saw early operators like Spire who had to build out their entire own ground networks. And now there's AWS and other providers that can provide third party services. Um, I think if you look at kind of each of the, the tiers, you have your, your manufacturers have scaled up. There's third party ground segment providers and there's a number of launch providers and rideshare brokers that make it a much more robust industry. Uh, and so I think investors see a lot of promise uh, in those areas, or, or I should say, uh, not only in those areas, but in the, the businesses that can be enabled by those. Absolutely. And standardization, you mentioned, can that be applicable to other 
segments and other parts of the value chain. Um, so particularly I'm thinking about launch and, um, you know, orbital, uh, you know, management. So maybe um, yeah, it probably might be a better question uh, for, for Connor. I think that uh, one of the things we are seeing is uh, spacecraft sizes, even among small satellites are going up. So while there was initially a lot of focus on CubeSats, we've seen new larger platforms from nanoavionics in York and Blue Canyon and Astro Digital and others. And uh, there is a continued trend towards bigger spacecraft that can do more. And the, the drop in launch costs has a lot to do with that. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. And I would say that um, we've never had a customer come to us and say, our satellite is, has become a lighter weight. It's always the opposite. So um, we've, um, we've seen a trend in general. There's been a broad trend um, away from CubeSats. I mean, CubeSats are still very popular, of course, but we see a lot of CubeSat manufacturers, including nanoavionics, now embracing microsat form factors um, as a way to increase their capability, decrease a lot of their um, constraints that they have with the CubeSat standard, particularly with regards to volume um, and, and mass. And, um, and so we've actually expanded our, our CubeSat separations, microsat separation system um, product line in order to, to meet this demand. So we, we originally just had one standard size, which is um, a 15 inch diameter, talking about standardization. This um, matched the, the microsat standard um, separation system that existed on the market. And now we're meeting other um, standard size um, uh, interfaces. So there's more than just the CubeSat standard when it comes to satellite design. There's also for microsat um, standard interfaces there. And so talking about the, the previous wave of investment versus this one, Vitenis's um, point from the beginning, uh, still we're going to see, you know, some of it is going to end up being speculation. There's going to be some consolidation. I wonder if any of the panelists have thoughts on what shape would make most sense, you know, what kind of either vertical integrations or horizontal integrations between companies um, we might see over, over the coming years as this business matures. I'll throw that, I'll throw that open. Sure, I can, I can uh, take a swing at it first. I think a lot of the consolidation that we saw, we've seen over the past five years, at least for small set manufacturers, has actually been defense primes buying those companies. Uh, I think Blue Canyon is the latest example. I think got acquired by Raytheon. Um, you'll also see, I mean, there was Boeing that bought Millennium. And uh, we expect that as a trend to continue, especially because of how much interest, uh, at least in the, in the US, the, the DOD is, is playing or is emphasizing on, on small satellite architectures for um, you know, military purposes with the SDA's constellation. So you saw four vendors, three of which are not the usual faces for this kind of thing, uh, win SDA awards, there was SpaceX, L3 Harris, York, and Lockheed. And Lockheed doing that in partnership with, uh, with Tyvek. So um, I think that uh, as small sat manufacturers emerge uh, and you know potentially threaten stable defense business, you're going to see more MA activity there. Um, another that hasn't happened, but uh, or at least I can't think of examples off the top of my head, but that would be interesting is uh, you still see a lot of operators choosing to vertically integrate. They haven't necessarily all gone to merchant suppliers where their sole focus is building small satellites. Uh, you still see a lot of IoT companies and synthetic aperture radar companies that are choosing to build in-house. And I think it would be interesting to see them build, buy a manufacturer. I doubt it will happen. Uh, I think there's been some component acquisitions or licensing, but uh, you know, that's a trend that I'd be curious to see if it develops. That's great. And then I suppose we've also got the, the headline grabbing big Leo constellations, but they will still not be able to do everything by themselves and they might start to see a competitive advantage in, in taking a greater role, maybe through acquisitions. Um, I don't know, um, the tennis, did you have any thoughts on that? 
for any foundation to mm. Yeah, the thoughts the, the thoughts are, are are right, and I agree with that. I mean, uh, we saw things, you know, 100 years ago where uh, airliner manufacturers were trying to run their airlines, or vice versa. I mean, airlines were trying to build the airplanes for themselves. But you know, 100 years ago, I mean, aviation wasn't that mature, and the market of aviation wasn't that mature, and. Um, the more mature becomes satellite market. I mean, we will see uh, more and more, you know, integration or consolidation within within the companies what they choose to do. I mean, if you if you do service, you do service. I mean, you do not build the satellites for yourself. We still see today that some manufacturers are trying to do, you know, IoT or M to M, whatever ADSB. Uh, or, or AIS, etc., cetera, or, or, or vice versa, as you mentioned. So I really believe that uh, this market is getting mature and it's evident, I mean, uh, what happened within the last 10 years. Um, so as for me, I'm, I'm a strong believer of, you know, making the satellite industry somehow similar to automotive industry. You know, um, we cannot do as conservative as, as old space, otherwise, no one will buy anything from us, but of course we cannot do, you know, prototyping style like, you know, like in garage, uh, the, uh, you know, in this, in this case, uh, the hardware and software will, will not that, uh, be that reliable. So somewhere between I see, you know, automotive style or automotive, let's say, you know, kind of, kind of industry, of course, not maybe in that big scale, uh, but something like that. So, this is, I believe, this is what is happening right now and where the entire market is going. So in another 10 years, I think, of course, we will see hundreds of, 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 of microsatellites in, in the orbit. Um, but, you know, they will be like, you know, small, small, small vehicles, I mean, small automobiles. Uh, a great question's just come in uh, in the chat, which is, you know, it's a golden age. It's from Tomas. Um, it's a golden age in investment in the space industry. Um, but then after that uh, is sort of complete, uh, companies will need to deliver and they'll be competing for resources. So do um, our kind of company panelists see any bottlenecks uh, competing for, say, talent or anything else um, over the next few years as the industry matures? Anna, perhaps. I just had to find the unmute button. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's a very good question. Uh, however, I think in the space industry, at least what I've seen is that we have a tendency to recruit engineers that have the same education uh, coming from space engineering backgrounds and so on. And to be able to do innovations and disruption, disruptive innovation, I think educations come from other places as well, not only space engineering. And therefore, you have a pool of, of new talents coming into the space industry and not necessarily uh, a, a shortage in, in people. But talents are always difficult to find and it's always difficult to recruit the right person. And uh, this is something that we pay a lot of attention to uh, at Trust Me is to, to recruit the right person instead of several. Uh, so we have stayed small intentionally uh, because we really handpick the right uh, talents for the right tasks. Uh, and I think this is, it, yes, it's a bottleneck uh, too because it's a complicated industry. I was muted as well. Uh, Connor over tennis, um, you know, do, do you see uh, competition for people or... Um, Anything else? Um, yeah, I agree with Anna. I mean, it's it's not easy. It's not easy to find a good talent. I mean, in our case, um, you know, kind of space guy, the right space guy is not only the uh, the the right education, right? It should be right attitude. I mean, overall, the market isn't. I mean, it's 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 relatively young, so we have a lot of challenges. You know, a lot of stresses. You know. Sometimes, sometimes customer is not 100% sure what does he want or, you know, we, we have, you know, some unexpected, let's say, behavior in the orbit or, you know, some, some other stuff. So 
you know, the right talent, the right guys is always, um, is always a, a challenge. And we are hiring from actually quite a number of various countries around European Union um, and United States. So the environment in different countries, of course, is different. Uh, in one, let's say, okay, in UK, for example, right? We have an office in UK. Uh, there is no doubt, I mean, uh, very long and deep traditions of aerospace, you know, aerospace engineering, rocket science, etc. This is one story. Another story is, for example, here in, in Lithuania, right? Uh, where we have, let's say, you know, fintech industries, laser industries, uh, some other kind of the industries, but space industry in, in particular do not have such a deep tradition. So, of course, we have a different approach how we do. Maybe we hire here, you know, younger people and then we train them and the training actually takes at least six months. Six between 12 months, you know, the average is, is nine months. So, for example, we hire, we find the right guy or, or you know, the right lady and, uh, you know, we sign the contract and then the process begins. And uh, so, you know, Depending on the country, the approach is a little bit different, but over, you know, all in all, it's not, it's not easy and not simple. After all, you know, it's cultural aspects, I mean, of the company, um, you know, personal things, uh, education, experience, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there is a like, you know, uh, you know, if, if you would have asked me like five years ago, I wouldn't imagine that we would have today, you know, HR um, department with recruiters, for example. And we're still a relatively small company. We are 100 people. So it's not easy after all. That's helpful. Um, so maybe uh, the, the, the most fun uh, question that we can kind of all, all chime in on, um, and I'm sure you'll all have strong opinions on this, is what... Uh, maybe if you could pick one or maybe two uh, are the most important or exciting new technologies that uh, will be commercialized in small sats uh, over the coming years. Now, uh, I imagine you might have to say your own. Uh, so, you know, argue why, please. <laughs> so um, perhaps we can go to Connor. Sure. I think, um, I think Anna will have will like what I have to say about one of them. I think propulsion technologies has been one of the missing tunes um, for, for a long time in the small site industry. And now um, we're getting to a point where we're seeing a whole bunch of players come onto the market um, right around the same time. And um, this, is, this is part of why we felt um, key to, to announce our, our uh, it was the right time to announce our Space Tug program. Um, because because of the availability of thrusters and the variety of, of different thrusters with different uh, performance characteristics that they have, that we can um, create the right vehicle um, to um, to to meet the demand and to to try and predict the future demand of, of where the market will be. Sorry, uh, doorbell's ringing. Um, but I think the other um, the other technology that is. Um, has flown under the market for or under the radar for a lot of people is, is actually separation systems. It's one of the um, it's one of the key elements of any any space mission. And um, before before really before CubeSats, before we were here too, there was really only the old space players that you had to source these separation systems from, and they're very expensive. They have very long lead times, uh, and they require often licenses to be able to operate, which are very expensive to get. Um, and so we're, we're trying to get in and disrupt that market and make um, the whole separation system um, process, acquisition process easier, the uh, adaptation process simple, and, um, and try and make access just that much easier for people to, to have. Anna, did you, uh, did you agree with Connor there? Sounded like... <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, thank you, Connor. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so now, since you picked the propulsion aspect, I will not say, talk about propulsion because it's an obvious uh, thing for me to, to say. Um, what I think is also very important and is coming now is, for example, uh, high precision GPS uh, on board, because actually we are not so sure about e the exact precision of the satellites. Um, and this has an impact on collision avoidance maneuvers and so on. And in the past, we had to use very high thrust maneuvers to do collision avoidance. 
Uh, and uh, this is a big problem for small satellites because the AOCS systems need to be much more precise than if you use low thrust uh, solutions. So to have low thrust solutions uh, where do you do collision avoidance operations is not so, so evident because you don't have precise uh, orbital predictions. And I think that is the next, uh, next big thing. Uh, it's also very important for, for example, the SARC constellations to be on precise orbits. Uh, the more precise you can be, the smaller the, your payloads can be. Uh, so I think that is the, one of the things that we will see in the future, uh, orbital predictions. Great, and we'll definitely come back to that issue of uh, the increasing crowded uh, low Earth orbit. Um, Caleb, what, what are you seeing that might be, you know, kind of flying under the radar or, you know, a, a new technology that, that's, you know, a potential um, commercial opportunity? Sure. So we did a report on small sats uh, late last year and actually identified six technologies that we thought were going to be uh, really important over the next a few years. We didn't kind of bracket it, say five years or 10 years, but... Um, I would say two of the most important ones and that are perhaps most rapidly developing are again propulsion. So uh, another shout out to, to Anne. Uh, and the second one we had was uh, inter satellite links. And I think what's interesting about both of those is that you're seeing a lot of demand for those from the mega constellations, particularly the broadband ones. And as far as inter satellite links are concerned, there's a very small number in orbit. Uh, and not, you know, it was also something that was essentially relegated to technology demonstrations until recently. So we're going from talking about maybe having 10 uh, laser optical satellite links in orbit to hundreds and thousands between what SpaceX wants and what Telesat wants and what SDA wants and potentially other companies. So there's a big shift there. Some of the other technologies that we identified that were important were uh, new antennas uh, for you know, space grade antennas, whether they be phased arrays or deployable, inflatable, inferrable systems, um, onboard uh, guidance, navigation, and control systems for improved pointing and stability, uh, and autonomous flight operations. That's great. I think that was, was that two or three? Uh, I'm kind of curious about what the other, <laughs> some others from the six, if you're able to share one or two more. You took them all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, that was about, actually, I think I did go through all of them. The, the only oh, one that I oh, left oh, off is uh, onboard processing, but that's because some of the processing can be in the spacecraft and some can be in the ground. And it'll be curious to see where that pans out. I think, uh, but for telecom and for remote sensing, uh, onboard processing is, is integral for cross-link spacecraft because they have to route the traffic. And then for remote sensing spacecraft, they want to figure out what data is actually useful so that they don't beam back, you know, a million pictures of clouds when they wanted to send you like you know, the Niger Delta or something. So that, that'll be important too. Great. Um, and Vitanis, I mean, you you have an interesting perspective as a as a integrator of sorts. So I mean, what uh, what parts do you see as the biggest opportunities? Yeah, I agree with the colleagues. I mean, uh, space access problem we see, I mean, it is being solved, right? Uh, propulsion systems, right, it's important. Um, but the communication, um, essentially, which allow us to communicate with the satellite anytime, anywhere. I mean, over the oceans, over the deserts, intersat link, intersat link, I mean, Leo to Leo, intersat link, Leo through Geo. Um, when we will forget, you know, the that speed of the internet, it was like, you know, 15 years, years ago, speed of the internet was kind of limiting factor, but we forgot that it is possible that the internet might be slow. So once we will have it like this done in, in, in the area of the satellites, so I think, you know, the, 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 the real globalization will come into, into this industry. So I think this is the next step, which, which is being solved, of course, you know, Having said that, we have space access, we have, uh, we have you know, um, propulsion, for example, uh, power generation systems, et cetera. So now, now at, at least from our perspective, we are working to solve um, um, communication problems. 
And just actually a question that sort of combines the last two questions, sort of bottlenecks and uh, key technologies, uh, and indeed consolidation. Do you, we expect uh, on the panel uh, some of the big players, defense companies or the mega constellations to try and annex strategically important technologies? So if, if there emerges a front runner in inter-satellite links, for example, or do you think that we'll be able to continue with an open access collaborative um, sector? Any thoughts? My first impression is that there's not a front runner in anything at this point, <laughs> um, and that uh, there's no there's no obvious candidate to to swoop down and and take from the market. Um, but it seems, yeah, without you know, with having such a, a large playing field and so many um, so many companies um, operating right now with so much promise, I think um, it'll be a while before we see that sort of move being made. Um, but that it, it's my impression from the from the supply side, I guess. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that right now we're still seeing a number of new ventures for a lot of different technologies. I mean, even going back to propulsion, I think there's something like two dozen companies that are working on small set propulsion right now. So there's no way to corner that market just yet. Um, the same thing in launch, there's more launch vehicles being developed that will ever fly. Um, like you can kind of look at most industry subsectors and, and just see a number of players and uh, time will tell who the winners and losers are. But right now it's, uh, it's not clear. Absolutely. Um, now, uh, mentioned it a couple of times and uh, I think Anna at the beginning shared that great quote from Gwen Shotwell about, um, you know, flying a brick. Um, you know, Increasingly, my colleagues who you know have a more than glancing interest in space are seeing this slight risk of it becoming a wild west in in, in Leo. So, you know, what can and should be done about this about this growing threat? Uh, you know, using technologies at the companies uh, that you work at, but also regulation uh, obviously will play a role. Um, I'd be interested to hear everyone's thoughts on that. So, um, Vitanis, would you like to go first? Um, yeah, if I understand your question correctly, um, so um, some of the some of the things are being implemented um, so far. I mean, like again, uh, propulsion technologies. I mean, you mean collision avoidance? If 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 I if I understand correctly, please. Uh, well, perhaps you know avoidance, perhaps clear up, perhaps AI management. You know, what's what's the key to, to solving this before it becomes a problem? Yeah. So uh, we, we all know that European Space Agency is, is, you know, talking pretty actively about the, you know, clean space initiatives, etc. So uh, sooner or later, some, you know, the orbiting technologies will be a mandatory to install in, into your satellite. I mean, whatever, which is uh, um, solar sail or, 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 you know, some other drag inducing devices or, or you know, propulsion system propulsion systems, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it might become a problem. And historically, we of course have some close proximity, you know, events or even collisions of the satellites. So uh, better tracking, better tracking would be helpful. I mean, in the past we had, we had some experiments related to propulsion systems. I mean, we have our own uh, propulsion system developed uh, for, for, you know, let's say some, some kind of the applications based, based on chemical monopropellant. So for example, then we were planning the, uh, the maneuvers, we can do pretty accurate analysis for ourselves, but we do not know in particular if we will not collide or, you know, interfere with other orbits. And for example, the data which we, which we can get from NORAD, is uh, well low pass filtered so to say and uh, it is really hard you know to 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 do accurate predictions so one of the steps i would see of course more accurate data of 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 other objects flying in orbit that would be really helpful at least from my perspective as for now that's great yeah i think more open access data and more industry pooling of data um as happens in leo uh, in geo but beg my pardon 
uh, will be will be really important. Um, what 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 do you think, Anna? Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, in the long term, when you when you have uh, all those satellites operating, um, there is uh, a need for traffic management because. Uh, if you have all these constellations moving with low thrust operation, the NORAD uh, informations that we get are not good enough. Uh, so it's definitely something that we need to, to work on as a community is the, is the regulations or traffic management in general. Uh, and you can see that with one now, for example, with the launch of OneWeb and going through the, the cloud of, uh, of SpaceX's satellite. I mean, it's going to be harder and harder and harder. Yes, we're at the early days and it already seems to be a kind of a weekly story. Um, and how about on the, on the propulsion side? Is there more that can be, um, you know, perhaps people don't appreciate that kind of reactive uh, and the, the, what you were saying about more subtle maneuvers? Yeah, so I think for propulsion, I think now, as Caleb said, there are many uh, out there that is uh, developing propulsion systems. And the reason is that it's really needed for these small satellites and it was not obvious uh, in the past. Uh, in the past, it has not been available. Now we have systems available. Uh, so there is no reason not to use propulsion anymore. But to give you just the numbers, it's many people that are working on it, but it's not many people that have tried tried out propulsion for small satellites in space. And uh, there was a, a ESA CubeSat workshop uh, on propulsion uh, last week. And uh, actually it's only 87 satellites, uh, small satellites below 50 kilo that have been using propulsion in the past. That's just very, very few. So we don't have a lot of experience. Mm. Uh, and now it is coming and uh, electric propulsion is very complicated solution. You have had many different uh, tests in space. Uh, and now I, I believe the systems are now mature enough to integrate it into also the small set uh, constellations and understand how to operate them. Because that is also something that is the next step is to, from having to propulsion to how to drive the car with a, it's, it's not the same. So you need to, uh, to also be able to operate the, the propulsion system in the best uh, way possible. I'd still like to get Connor and Caleb's thoughts, but I'm just interested in um, maybe the question of regulation as well, because it seems like the FCC is obviously uh, in the front uh, on this, because it has to be, because uh, SpaceX is, is registered in the US. But is there... A, greater role that regulators can play? Is there kind of a, a bit of a vacuum at the moment? Um, maybe. Is it for me, the question? Um, Anna or indeed Conor or Caleb, who um, I don't think have had a chance to, to ch speak on this one yet. Uh, go ahead, Gil, go ahead. So, um, you know, I think that one of the interesting things that happened when the FCC tried to introduce some um, new rules around orbital debris uh, I don't. I haven't looked at it very recently. So, calling off the top of my head, you know, there was uh, an intention to basically mandate uh, propulsion for certain small sets, uh, and there was actually a surprising amount of resistance to that from the industry, amongst other things. Uh, but you know, even the past couple of weeks, I think Planet sent a report to the FCC saying, hey, we've shown that if we're low enough in the atmosphere, we can still move around without propulsion. And you know, that's one of the largest small set constellations out there. So there's, there's, not, um, there's not a universal embrace amongst small set operators to just have propulsion for propulsion's sake. Uh, yes, I think it would make the space domain safer but it also, you know, it's a cost. Uh, it's a cost in terms of money. It's a cost in terms of mass. Uh, it can add some complexity to the spacecraft. And so there's, some, there's just some resistance to that. Uh, and the FCC is conscious of the fact that they don't want to make policies that, that discourage companies from having their business in the U.S. Uh, I mean, I think I'm the only American on this panel. Uh, and so it just shows you how... Me too, actually. Oh, all right. Well... For a German company, but yes, 
uh, <laughs> but this is, this is a very global industry and uh, they're very conscientious of that. Um, so, so I would be curious to see how good regulation could be done. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have answers. It's always easier to point at the problem than to give the solution. Uh, I will say that some interesting things that have happened, uh, I think the fact that OneWeb and Telesat have both discussed having grappling hooks mm. on their spacecraft so that if they fail, somebody can send a tug or something and deorbit it. That's really novel. And I think that there's an increased emphasis on making sure that upper stages come down so that even uh, missions like the one that uh, ClearSpace is going to do to deorbit a Vega uh, upper stage component, those should be less frequent in the future if, if all companies uh, and launch providers are diligent about bringing those stages down. So there are some proactive behaviors that are being taken, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. Now we've got about three minutes left. I've just had an interesting question from the floor. Um, is it possible, you know, how can you have propulsion for the very smallest nano and pico satellites? Um, or or is, that, is that kind of a challenge in and of itself to even consider that? Open to anyone. Maybe I can answer that one. Uh, pico satellites, I don't know. I think it's very, very small systems. Uh, for nanosatellites, it depends on when you start. Uh, we have a system now that is in space and delivered to de in different clients. It's a half year system uh, operating on five watts of, uh, and it uh, has lifetime extension and so on. So it's definitely possible. Um, it's difficult to do, but it's, it's possible. What you need to do is to have a, uh, enough trust, uh, not enough, uh, not a lot of power, uh, and that you can have uh, enough delta V to do something useful. It's not if you, it's not easy, but uh, there are solutions now out there for low power solutions as well. Great, and um, now now we have about two minutes left. I just maybe ask a, a final one, uh, and just like a kind of a quick thought from everyone, maybe uh, trying to throw it forwards. You know, in a couple of sentences, what huge uh, small sat Leo sat news will be all, we'll be talking about in a year's time. I mean, 2020 was such a big year for the industry. Um, what do you think we'll be talking about in, in 2022? The tennis? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I'm waiting for the news where people connecting the satellites with a cell phone and, you know, extending, extending the globalization beyond the current current understanding so this is what i'm waiting for i mean the communication of the cell phone regular cell phone through the satellite great uh connor um honestly i hope it's uh it's more the, more of the same um that uh we keep breaking records and that we keep growing um i'm also looking forward to to uh, news on active space uh, active debris removal um, in space that that milestone um, is uh, achieved and, and furthered and that um, Excel launch will eventually be a part of that, that goal. Brilliant, thanks. And, and Caleb, uh, can you kind of do your best Nostradamus and uh, guess what <laughs> we might be writing about in a year? Uh, I'm optimistic that we'll see at least a couple, hopefully two or three new launch vehicles, small launch vehicles, uh, have their maiden flight or, or first successful flight that deliver a payload into orbit. Uh, that's something that I, I'm watching. I think that there were a number that were expected over the past two years, but there's always delays. And so I'll be really curious to see 12 months from now who's got in space. Great. And Anna, last, last word to you, and then I'll hand it back to, uh, to Tony. Yes, I th so f when it comes to the technologies, I think what we will maybe see is proximity operations and, and robotics in space, which is, uh, is relatively new. We see the trends in the, in the traditional actors, and I think this will also come in the in new space. Uh, we also have uh, companies uh, that are trying to remove debris uh, from, from orbit, and I think this is also something we will speak about uh, in the media. Brilliant. Uh, well, I think that's it uh, from me. So it's been a pleasure. Uh, great to have such some depth and breadth of expertise on the panel. And um, you know, thank you to Access Space Alliance for inviting me to, you know, basically uh, ride on everyone's coattails and, and listen to a great panel. So, so thanks, everyone. I hope it was interesting to you as well.
Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I hope that in the future you will invite us, the Access Space Alliance, to host us on a conference at your premises. We will like to travel and uh, get together physically rather than actually being virtual. But nevertheless, we managed to get at least 100 people on average for each panel, attending each panel. It's been great uh, for the past couple of days. Thank you for uh, putting together the panel at the very last minute. We had this uh, session organized for something else, and uh, we decided at the last minute to welcome you uh, with this great uh, discussion and panel. Thank you very much.